down in, in the house and then moving upward from the lower part to into the upper right and finally the man himself. And this is my old um, China, uh, fantastic eccentric catalog. I really wrote <laughs> this kind of thing better then than I could now. I, uh, this is a distant uh, memory of somebody who really wrote better than I, this kind of thing better than I can. Here we go. In the most powerful leaf of them all, number um, blank, a man is seen at his desk in a house beneath an overhanging cliff. The rocks are outlined with thick, broken, dragged strokes, varying in tone from pale gray to the deepest black, with the heaviest areas leading the eye from the right foreground along an S-curve that encloses the house. The upward-pointing rocks below initiate the movement, which is carried upward and back by interweaving strokes like streams of pure energy that dissipate at last into the void at upper right. Wow, I wish I could write like that. Everything interpenetrates, interacts. The Taoist and Neo-Confucian conception of the world as organism is set forth here as compellingly as in any Sung painting. Over the whole structure are scattered large dim, that is dots in large blue and red-brown tones, another brilliant innovation of Tao Ji's. He was then called Tao Ji. Now we call him Shi Tao. That's another question. They do not cling to the masses, but seem to hover above them, like agitated motes of weighted ma weightless matter, reducing the bulk of the underlying forms to the point where rocks change before one's eyes from corporeal objects to insubstantial networks of line, like grasses blown in the wind. Scarcely noticed at first in the midst of all this is the scholar in his retreat, gazing outward surrounded by sheer bursts of light and color and movement, but remaining placid. Wow. Okay, that's the way I wrote in those days. Now, everybody has, including me, has taken this as a brilliantly original work. Could this be a derivative work? No, of course not. Nobody could have done this except by sheer brilliant um, uh, origin, uh, uh, invention. And it's been seen, I think, properly as a well, it is a brilliantly original work, there's no question of that. But later I realized, and when I came upon another picture, um, that in fact he had taken some of the conception, some of the, uh, some of the elements of the picture from an earlier painting by the artist Gung Shen. Now in my compelling image book, in treating Shertel, I show how he went around during his long career uh, coming into contact with the different schools of painting, the Anhui school in his early period, the uh, the uh, Nanjing school, Gung Shen and Fan Qi and others in the 1680s, uh, and then uh, later the uh, so-called Orthodox masters in Beijing when he went there and so on, and how these the, these contacts affected his own painting, how he borrows, adopts certain uh, forms and techniques and Treats of, uh, and traits of style and uses them in his own paintings. And this is in no way, uh, you know, against his originality as part of his brilliance he's able to do these. That, that, ar that argument has been questioned or opposed by some people, but all right, I still believe it. Um, I had a seminar on Chertow and uh, Richard Vinograd was in it and wrote an article on the same theme, quite, quite fine, which he published. Okay, anyway. Now here's, I discovered, haha, <laughs> here it is, a leaf from an album by Gung Shen uh, in the Palace Museum in Beijing in color. Gung Shen paintings in color are quite rare, and this is a rare example and quite marvelous example. Now, this has to be earlier because Gung Shen died in 1689, while the Shi Tao album, my dating would be mid-1690s, and in any case, nobody's going to date it back. So this time, and what, how does it how is it like? They're very different, of course. But what what does he take from Kung Chen? First of all, the house in this case is not a house with a man in it, but just a, a small uh, three-story house built on the edge of the cliff, sort of surrounded by the cliff. But more than that, the use of color, the pale uh, blue-green color and the uh, yellow-orange color, and the, uh, the rather loose dissolved lines that seem to push upward from the bottom as uh, to build a movement that comes up and centers on this house and then sort of swirls around it into the uh, cliffs above. And perhaps most of all, the use of dian or dots, which are 
not only hovering around outside the forms, as I pointed out on the Shir Tao painting, here's a detail of the Gung Shen, which will show this better. They not only hover uh, uh, somewhat apart from the forms, but they're done in orange and green or blue-green color. So Gung Shen starts out these quite wonderful uh, new ideas, and um, uh, Shir Tao takes it up, takes them up, and produces a, a more extreme, more radical, and perhaps even more brilliant uh, version of it. Well, it's, but, but it's interesting. To, I mean, I find it extremely interesting, and it goes along with my whole idea about the creation of art and the importance of drawing on the past, and the fact that drawing on the past in creative ways like this does not in any way uh, take away the originality of the artist. This is a a, a complete misconception which has been uh, perpetuated in lots of writings about Chinese art anyway. In other words, drawing productively on the past does not erode originality in any way. Usually it's, on the contrary, it strengthens the work. Okay, enough for that point, and I hope it's made powerfully by these two paintings.